Amid the majestic vistas, pristine waters, and wild backcountry of America, National Park lodges and inns are almost as celebrated as the landscapes surrounding them. A room with a view of one of the wonders of the world, one of the world's largest log cabins, an oasis in the Mojave Desert, and an island jewel. Join us as we travel off the beaten path to luxurious getaways and rustic retreats where nature reigns and the romance of the past lives on. National Park's Lodges and Inns begins with one of the first and most famous of them all the Old Faithful Inn. Located in Yellowstone National Park, near its namesake, Old Faithful. While Yellowstone's star attraction puts on one of the Earth's greatest shows, the Old Faithful Inn has been dazzling the crowds for over a century. The inn was the bold creation of a young architect in 1904. Robert Reamer, the architect, decided he could provide the same amenities of a first-class hotel, but do so in a rustic way that gave people the idea that they were still in a national park. The whole idea of fitting a building in with the landscape being important. The style, called parkitecture, incorporates elements like hand-hewn logs cut from the forests, a facade of rhyolite from a local stone quarry, and other native materials to create a building that blends into the landscape. A building made for geyser gazing. It was actually a law that said they could not build within an eighth of a mile of a natural feature. And the east side of this building is exactly one eighth a mile from Old Faithful. But also set the building in such a way as visitors pulling up in front of the building, eyes were directed down to see Old Faithful on approach. Once inside, a massive lobby awaits. You walk into any day of the, of the week and into the lobby of Old Faithful Inn and all the people whose necks are craned looking upward, they're the visitors. Usually their mouths are open also because it's a, it is a fabulous building. Described as a cross between a trapper's cabin and a Gothic cathedral, the lobby is the heart of the hotel. An atrium with three levels of balconies rises to the height of a seven-story building. As the sun moves throughout the day, it streams in to create the effect of being in a forest. The architect had a sense of whimsy and an eye for twisted trees. There was a small group of men during construction that was sent out in the woods just to look around for those, um, what one early newspaper called freaks of nature that were incorporated into the construction. The gnarled branches along the railings climb up to a platform called the treehouse that leads to the crow's nest at the top. The treehouse is closed off to visitors unless you're lucky enough to tag along with the inn's bell porter. Each day, he climbs up the wooden labyrinth to the roof, and he's allowed to take two guests with him to hoist and lower the flags. Several flags fly over this huge hotel. The main building, along with the east and west wings, have a total of 327 rooms. And on any day, James Chapman and his kitchen staff must be ready to feed a small army. Working here has one unique challenge. Here at the Old Faithful area, we have geyser rushes. Uh, Old Faithful goes off about every 90 minutes, and you know you can almost set your watch by it, and in comes the crowds. The inn has been a hub of activity from the beginning. In an earlier era, the area around the fireplace was a dance floor. 
And this is not your ordinary hearth. The fireplace is made of 500 tons of rock. It remains the centerpiece of the lobby. Affixed to the chimney is one of the inn's signature pieces, a 14-foot pendulum wind-up clock. Below, the fireplace screen is one of many wrought iron details. Maintaining the iron requires a blacksmith. At the Prairie Elk Forge, George Ainsley keeps things burning red hot, replicating one-of-a-kind hardware. It had been almost 85 years since the first work was done on the inn, and the pressing issue was the front doors. Quite a few of the decorative rivet heads on the outside of the door were missing. And some of those are actually functional. They're a rivet head that holds the hinge to the door, and others are decorative. To produce that, I had to make a forging die off the original pieces so I could replicate exactly the forgings that were used on that door. Like a castle in the wild, with heavy locks and a 15-inch key, the doors are meant to convey a sense of entering a safe haven. And this grand dom of the National Park Lodges is truly a survivor. In the 70s, there was talk of tearing it down, but it was saved by a massive restoration. On the night of September 7, 1988, an out-of-control wildfire raged dangerously close. Guests had to be evacuated. And I remember thinking, there is no way we're going to save that. Suddenly, hundreds of gallons of water poured off the roof. As a result of the restoration project that went on in the 1980s with the Old Faithful Inn, a new sprinkler system was installed in the building in 1987. Once again, the inn was saved this time by a sprinkler system less than a year old and a last minute shift in the wind. The building, hailed as one of the world's largest log cabins, continues to welcome millions of visitors. It's an icon of Yellowstone and indeed of the entire national park system. It means Yellowstone almost as much as Old Faithful Geyser itself does. Its influence has even reached as far as Orlando. If your travels take you to the Walt Disney World Resort, you'll find a familiar sight. Looking for inspiration for Disney's Wilderness Lodge, one of the lodges they looked to was the Old Faithful Inn. With gray granite peaks and green valleys, Yosemite National Park is hailed as one of America's greatest treasures. Tucked away in a secluded corner sits the Queen of Yosemite, the Iwani Hotel. The Iwani was the brainchild of Stephen Mather, the first director of the National Park Service. For Yosemite, his favorite national park he had grand plans. And he felt it very important to get the American public on board in the concept of national parks. And he felt that by creating a lodging like this one, which was comfortable, would attract people and attract support for the national parks. Architect Gilbert Stanley Underwood was chosen to create a luxury hotel to complement an idyllic valley. He not only emulated the outdoors in the building structure, but he did kind of surpass that idea. He oriented the building so that it would take advantage of the most scenic features of the valley. Um, one wing of the building is oriented towards Yosemite Falls, which is a classic icon of the park. One wing is oriented towards Half Dome. So not only did he emulate the feeling of the valley, but he, he took advantage of the, what the valley most has to offer. The granite facade blends the hotel into the valley walls. Yet Underwood was a modern architect ahead of his time. 
he even devised an ingenious way to make it fireproof. Everything that looks like wood on the exterior of the building is actually concrete. They cut uh, wood, they made forms of rough sawn lumber, and then they poured the concrete into the form and then stained it the color of the trees surrounding. So virtually this building is a fortress of stone, of concrete, and steel. A grand fortress that more than doubled its original budget cost one and a quarter million dollars to build in 1927. Inside, you'll see why. Even after all these years, when I walk in this hotel, I, I get wowed. I hear people gasp when they walk in the hotel. The public spaces are, are tremendous and awe-inspiring, and people react to those rooms when they see them. Awani comes from the Native American name for a deep valley. It's here the Native American theme begins. Above the hearth, one signature piece is an abstract mural inspired by basket patterns. I think when people come out of the elevator lobby and walk into the Great Lounge, that's another place where they stop in this hotel and just kind of go, wow, and stop and look around for a minute because it's not just beauty at eye level when you walk in, it's beauty 360 degrees. The Great Lounge was designed to dazzle the eye. Windows rise 24 feet high. Like much of the hotel, they feature Native American designs. They took the arts and crafts movement of hidden alcoves, exposed beams, handmade furnishings, handmade wood pieces, and the beautiful chandeliers and the, all the lighting pieces are all wrought iron. They were handmade for the Awani. They're very specific in their style. One way to get a sense of scale is to see people in front of this massive fireplace. Yet, there are creature comforts in the form of intimate alcoves and sitting areas. And much of the original furniture remains intact. With a 34-foot vaulted ceiling, the dining room is another awesome space. With seating for 350, On the hotel's top floor, one of the premier rooms, the library suite, comes with a sitting area named for the architect, Gilbert Stanley Underwood, and a view of Yosemite Falls. In addition to 99 guest rooms, there are 24 cottages a short walk from the hotel. They too offer comfort, rustic furnishings, and a cozy setting with a view of Half Dome right outside your door. Since it is the great outdoors that draws visitors here, the hotel will gladly hook you up with any adventure you desire. Good afternoon, how may I help you today? The job of a concierge in Yosemite is unique. We're not getting tickets to the hottest show in town, but we are helping people make the most of their visit while they're in Yosemite, whether it's helping them with a hike, getting them a climbing lesson, a whitewater rafting trip, a bicycle rental. There's something for everybody to do here, and we help make those arrangements for them. Okay, do we keep this? Yes. Okay. It might not surprise you that this magical spot that marries the outdoors with the indoors is overwhelmed by wedding requests. I now pronounce you husband and wife. I had one guest who was married here. She actually met her husband in the park, was married in the chapel, and had a reception here in the solarium. She probably said the greatest thing that emulates that. She said, Julie, you know, some people come to Yosemite for the Awani, but some people come to the Awani and discover Yosemite. The Awani solarium, surrounded on three sides by light, brings the wedding party indoors, where no detail is overlooked. Gourmet meals are prepared in a modern 6,500 square foot kitchen. I think people, when they come to Iwani, they have an expectation. They, they have a, a history with the Iwani. There's a lot of return guests, and they're looking for uh, some of the, the local flavors and uh, fare that they're accustomed to. 
People are also accustomed to great service and surroundings. Mr. Powers, your halibut. The Awani's dining hall is considered to be the height of the hotel's elegance. And over the years, many famous people have stayed here. We've had presidents and governors, movie stars, and most people know Ansel Adams as a world-famous nature photographer. However, he was an artist of another kind as well and had a career in music. He played the piano here at the Awani. The late Ansel Adams' daily concerts became part of the hotel's history. History that's kept alive when the same grand piano is played in the afternoons. For Ansel Adams, Yosemite was life-changing. He spent 60 years capturing its grandeur. With the eye of a painter, he turned photography into an art form. His celebrated images not only championed the cause of conservation, but forever linked him to Yosemite and the national parks. And he was one of the originators of another Awani tradition. Each December, the dining room is turned into a storybook setting for one of the more unique events in all of the national parks, the Bracebridge Dinner. We are honored by the presence tonight of the distinguished guests upon my left and right. Part feast and part musical pageant, Bracebridge, based on a 17th century English winter fest, was inspired by the writings of Washington Irving. It was first held here on December 25th, 1927. It's fantastically wonderful to have something where someone as famous and wonderful and talented as Ansel Adams created it, um, all the way down to what we have now, which is a group of professional singers who are devoted toward having the tradition continue. Bracebridge is one of the many traditions of a special place where time seems to stand still in a setting made famous by one of the greatest photographers of the 20th century. Hailed as one of the wonders of the world, the Grand Canyon will leave you speechless. For many, this great abyss that's been around for millions of years demands more time. If you want to spend the night, choices range from a famous four-star hotel perched on the rim to a hidden gem that draws people back year after year. We did the South Kebab Trail the first time and really enjoyed that. Then Rim to Rim, we heard about Rim to Rim, we had to do that. This place is beautiful um, and it's different every year. We'll begin at the rim with El Tovar. It is a Grand Canyon experience to stay in El Tovar. The canyon is right there, uh, and of course that's the main reason to be here, but staying in that famous hotel is, is a very, uh, is a goal for a lot of people. And I think it does enhance the stay here at the Grand Canyon. It gives you a certain elegance and a glimpse into the past. Named for Pedro El Tovar, a 16th century Spanish explorer, the hotel really hasn't changed much over the years. A cozy lobby, dubbed the Rendezvous Room, is a welcoming place to meet that looks like a cross between a hunting lodge, a Swiss chalet, and a Norwegian villa. The hotel cost a record quarter of a million dollars to build in 1905. It was special for its time here at the village, for sure, because um, it was the only accommodations here that had running water that actually had indoor toilets. In today's money, that would probably be somewhere in the area of eight to $10 million to build the structure. The woodwork was another reason for the cost. Its pillars and posts come from giant Douglas fir trees brought in by the Santa Fe Railroad. Overhead, the mezzanine lounge was once reserved for women only. It features an eight-sided balcony and Swiss-style woodwork. Off the lobby is El Tovar's dining room, a spot both rustic and elegant. 
Lining the walls, Native American murals depict the region's tribes. While much of the hotel remains intact, the 78 guest rooms were updated. When the hotel was remodeled to accommodate private baths in all the rooms, it, it, it got kind of a, almost a bed and breakfast atmosphere because all the rooms are different sizes and shapes. Suites are comfortable and some come with quite a view. Regardless of where you stay, at the Grand Canyon, everyone's welcome to enjoy the veranda. You can swing your cares away just like guests have done for a hundred years. I like bringing my friends here when they come to visit, because not only can you sit and enjoy the breeze and look out at the canyon, but they can imagine past presidents or people from almost a century ago doing the same thing, being astonished by the canyon. One addition from the 1950s, the back veranda, is another spot to sit a spell, write in a journal, or kick back and toast a special occasion. In many ways, the story of the park lodges is the story of the architects who built them. Mary Coulter began her long career at the canyon as the interior designer of El Tovar. She was hired to design Hopi House for the Santa Fe Railroad in 1905, the first of a series of structures built to enhance the destination experience. Drawing on regional native themes, this was once a place for the Hopi and Navajo to live and showcase their work. Today, it's a trading post for Native American arts and crafts. Coulter's other rim landmarks include Hermit's Rest, Lookout Studio, and the Desert View Watchtower, all built to blend beautifully with their surroundings. In the 1930s, she had a different idea for the Grand Canyon's Bright Angel Lodge with its adjoining complex of cabins. It's right in line with the National Park Service rustic style. Again, uh, solid massing, large beams being used, stone, wood being the predominant materials. She was rather eclectic in her approach. If you look around the cabins at the Bright Angel Lodge, you'll see that some are frame, some are stucco, some are log. Among them, one cabin stands out. It belonged to Bucky O'Neill, an early Grand Canyon entrepreneur, and Mary Coulter took note of it. She demanded, and she usually got what she demanded, she demanded that the Bucky O'Neill cabin be saved. Today, guests can spend the night in Bucky's suite, a two-room cabin that's been here since 1895. Along the rim, Bright Angel Trail, an ancient Indian footpath, leads to the canyon floor. And another Coulter creation only a few visitors ever see. To get there from the rim, you have to hike or hop on a mule. Some of these mules tend to walk the edge. Don't worry about it, nothing you can do about it. We train them that way. So Y'all get a good view. <laughs> A cross between a donkey and a horse, mules are sure-footed because they don't put themselves in any kind of danger. And that's a good thing to remember when the trail drops 4,400 feet and you hold onto your mule for dear life. If the drop doesn't get you, temperatures that can soar over 100 degrees in the shade just might. At the end of the 9.7 mile ride, the Colorado River is a sight for sore eyes. And after riding tall in the saddle, it's hard for some city slickers to get their land legs back. 
So don't be surprised to have a hitch in your giddy up. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your official welcome to Phantom Ranch. Thank you. Welcome to Phantom Ranch. We're going to talk for a couple of minutes before we go to the ranch. So take a walk, drink a whole bunch of water. It's amazingly dry down here. Your bodies have lost a lot of fluids on the ride in. Well, the challenge of getting here is one of the more memorable parts of your visit. Most people don't remember the, the bed that they slept in or the cabin that they slept in, but they certainly remember the journey itself. Phantom Ranch has been welcoming folks since 1922 to this complex of cabins made of wood and uncut river stone. Sleeping accommodations are simple. Here you enter another world, a retreat in the narrow rock created by architect Mary Coulter. The vision was a place that's tucked away at the bottom of the Grand Canyon that's romantic, that's mysterious, and so she chose the name Phantom. But she got the name not because we have ghosts and specters walking around down here, but because there's a little creek about a mile and a half north of us called Phantom Creek. And uh, that's where the name Phantom Ranch came from. Above all, it's the location that makes this place so exceptional. The Phantom Ranch complex itself is, uh, is, is an oasis. It's an oasis in the middle of the Grand Canyon. We've got the creek to go swimming in. We've got uh, trees for shade, uh, very relaxing, peaceful grounds. If the ride down didn't do you in, there's plenty to explore on the canyon floor. It's a great day for a walk at Grand Canyon National Park. Chris Boatwright organizes yearly hiking trips with a group of friends, an experience she calls a reality check. Everybody gets sometimes so locked into the hustle and bustle of everyday world, but then when you come here, it's just so laid back, and you no longer take for granted the things that you do every day long in the cities. So we really do enjoy coming here every year. It's a great place. Phantom Ranch is a step back to the days when mule trains were a mode of transportation. A daily run brings all the necessities, including food. Oh, you brought me a cup of coffee. Nobody loves you more than I do, honey. Thank you. And guests are still called to dinner the old-fashioned way. Come on over, everybody, for steak dinner. Oh, yeah. Nobody leaves Phantom Ranch hungry. And in this place where all sorts of people share an experience, meals are served up family style. All part of the Western hospitality. Last man out's the winner. Hey, see you at the top. Give me a big jump. Good girl. Once you go down, you have to come back up. The nearly mile-high ascent to the rim begins at sunup to beat the heat. Yet visitors say they're changed by their stay. I see a lot of that down here. People really just kind of getting in tune with the canyon and getting in tune with nature and really finding a little piece of themselves that maybe they didn't know was there. It definitely touches the soul. You realize that you're a smaller part of something that's absolutely enormous. National parks can be found in some of the more remote corners of America. Cumberland Island National Seashore lies off the southern coast of Georgia. 17 and a half miles long and three miles wide, it's the nation's biggest wilderness island. Tranquil and untamed, this Georgia gem has been called the ultimate getaway. There's only one place to spend the night, a southern mansion full of history, grace, and romance, the Grayfield Inn. But to stay here, you first have to get here. The only way is a 40-minute boat or ferry ride to a private dock, where guests are met by the inn's wait staff. You can leave your luggage here on board as well. We have someone that will take that up to your rooms for you. With its columns and veranda, the Grayfield Inn looks like a plantation. Called Terra by the Sea, it's known for southern hospitality. Staying at this antebellum bed and breakfast is like taking a trip back in time 
to a secluded country estate. And the great thing about it is that everyone that comes here is someone I would love to meet because they all come for the right reasons. They come because uh, for the same love that we have for the island. Thomas Carnegie, the brother of industrialist Andrew Carnegie, built Grayfield as a wedding gift for his daughter in 1902. At one time, a staff of 40 walked the long veranda to wait on the Carnegies. But the upkeep of this mansion became costly. And my grandmother came up with a zany idea, Lucy, to start an inn. My grandmother always had the philosophy that it was going to be, as time went on, more and more unique. And she was right. Lucy Ferguson, the granddaughter of Thomas Carnegie, opened the inn in 1962. And it's been serving up a one-of-a-kind experience ever since. The inn's 16 rooms include a suite on the top floor. Each room has an elegant charm, and many of the furnishings are original. I think the thing that Grayfield does offer is it's as if you're coming for a weekend at, at our home, and nothing has changed here. In what guests describe as a museum without the velvet ropes, don't go looking for any modern-day distractions. We don't have televisions, we don't have phone systems, and it's an opportunity for people to come and completely separate themselves from all the surroundings in the big cities. And it's interesting to watch them wind down. It usually takes a couple of days, and then all of a sudden, they're just captured by the magic of Cumberland. A magic that comes from the island's unspoiled character and unhurried pace. A short walk from the main house, two spacious guest cottages offer elegance with more privacy. Since no cars are allowed on the island and the number of visitors are limited, guests truly get away from it all. Hopping on two wheels for a leisurely spin is a great way to take it all in. The big deal with Cumberland Island is it's one of the main wilderness areas on the east coast of the United States, which makes it very different. If you hear the patter of hooves, don't be surprised. Cumberland is the stomping ground of horses that run wild, just like they've done since Spanish explorers introduced them to the island in the 1500s. If solitude is what you seek, look no further. Cumberland's main attraction is the beach. Barren and wide open, it's a good bet you'll have it all to yourself. It's unbelievable this day and age that you can come to a spot so close to densely populated areas on either side of Cumberland and look up that 21 miles of beach and not see a soul. To safeguard this pristine place, the Carnegie family donated the island to the Park Service. But they maintained ownership of the property around the inn. They try to take care of the island, take care of the resources, and the Park Service uh, tries to work with them to make sure that, that visitors get to see this island. Cumberland's buildings range from the magnificent to the modest. A backwoods church was once a place of worship for a settlement of freed slaves. But in 1996, it served as the humble setting for a secret wedding between John F. Kennedy Jr. and Carolyn Bissett. A secret protected by the owners of the Grayfield Inn. No one knew, no one in my family knew, no one in John's family knew and we f flew everyone in in our plane, and it was just a very quiet, quiet, quick ceremony, and no one uh, came over and no one did any interviews, so it went away very quickly. But it was by far one of the most incredible experiences I've had. The wedding reception was held at the Grayfield, an appropriately formal spot, where the afternoon cocktail hour begins with hors d'oeuvres and guests pass the time on the veranda. Specializing in the regional cuisine of the island, there's an emphasis on seafood. For chef Ian Kitch, 
working in a house once occupied by millionaires has its challenges. They want everything to be like the Carnegie's had it. So my level of food has to be up there. And if it's not, you know, it's, they're going to be disappointed. Meals keep the romance of the old mansion alive. Every night, it's dinner by candlelight. The overall atmosphere is casual elegance. The comments that we get from people are just thank you for opening your home and sharing it with us. This Terra by the Sea offers one of the most distinctive experiences you'll find anywhere. An inn only outdone by its unique setting. A scenic sanctuary off the Georgia coast. With a serene beauty that shocks and surprises, Death Valley National Park, stretching along the California border, is one of the lowest, hottest, and driest places on the planet. But you never know what you'll find in the desert. Rising out of a rocky ridge at the base of the Funeral Mountains sits an oasis, the Furnace Creek Inn. Open from October to May, its origins lie deep in the mountains, where the mineral borax was once mined. Well, the inn was built by Pacific Coast Borax Company, and the reason they built it here is because they were leaving their mining concerns, but they loved Death Valley so much that they wanted to, to do something with the property. And because there are three natural springs right behind the property, they thought it would be a perfect place to build an inn. Today, the waters of this private property, surrounded by national parklands, are a life spring. Feeding lush grounds shaded by 70 palm trees. Stone paths wind over footbridges to a pond. Overhead, a bird of prey watches and waits for something to come by. Above the terrace landscape, the sprawling inn looks like a Spanish mission with its red tile roof. The thick adobe walls were made on site by the local Shoshone Indians and painted a shade of yellow called Furnace Creek Inn Adobe. I pondered that for a long time and then I realized it's the same color of yellow that you see in the badlands and the hills behind it. Um, the whole lower section of the inn is actually made out of rock and it's made out of, of, of alluvial fan material, which is what this building sets on top of. Um, alluvial fans are the material, the outwash from the canyons here. So what the architect did was to gather rocks from the area right below it and then build the entire lower section of the inn out of these rocks. It makes it look very rustic and kind of fits in with the landscape, especially when you look at it from below. Outside, Moorish-style arches are framed in stone. Inside, they frame comfortable sitting areas with views of the mountains. An adobe fireplace, trimmed in local stone, has been welcoming guests over the years. And the dining room hasn't changed much since the 20s. The inn's friendly staff will help you plan out your stay. Of the 66 guest rooms, one looks like a stone cottage. And it's a short stroll to another surprise. The pool is the centerpiece of the hotel. It's filled by natural warm springs, so the water is constantly replacing itself. So there's no need for any chemicals, and it's a constant 84 degrees year round. So it's fabulous. Water isn't wasted in the desert. It gets piped from the pool to a place where you can yell, four. This is no ordinary spot to swing a nine iron. At 214 feet below sea level, Furnace Creek's 18-hole course is the world's lowest grass golf course. You have to adjust your game to the altitude. Since the ball doesn't go as far, you can take a bit longer to soak in the scenery. 
Death Valley gets its name from a group of prospectors who nearly died trying to take a shortcut across it. But the land is far from dead. The first thing people are surprised by the Death Valley is that it's got life. I mean, Death Valley and all that. So if there's anything alive, that's, that's the thing that, that uh, kind of shocks them. Um, in fact, I've heard very often from people, oh, it shouldn't be Death Valley, it should be the Valley of Life, which is a stretch because it's so extreme here. The life that's here is very sparse, um, but it's highly adapted to, to dealing with those extremes. The other thing that surprises people are the mountains surrounding Death Valley. That's an unexpected thing. And I think the fact that we have water here. The valley was once a seabed. And when winter rains hit, this lowest point in the Western Hemisphere can fill up. An incredible phenomenon. After a day of sightseeing, there's no better way to refuel than afternoon tea at the inn, served in the lobby with all the trimmings. Eating at Furnace Creek is an eclectic affair. For chef Michelle Hansen, the inspiration for a signature dish comes straight from the desert. It's uh, our rattlesnake empanada, as I'll show you. It is actually farmed rattlesnake. We grind it up into sausage, which is, this is the end product. We put some peppers and some onions, a little cumin, some chili powder. So actually, it tastes like ground pork. It does not taste like chicken. So when we get ready to make the empanadas, we add a little savory cheese with it. Then we have little puff pastries that we have, a little bit of egg wash on them. Put them in our little empanada maker here. This is very popular. It's not something we just barely make. We'll serve a good 10 to 15 orders a night. And just squish it together and beautiful. Actually, it's very good. Once we serve it with a little guacamole, a little goat cream, it's very, very yummy. And what to drink with rattlesnake? Among other events, the inn offers wine weekends to sample the fruits of the vine. This tasting of wines from Le Cuvier, French for little barrel room, comes from California's central coast. And the Pinot Blanc has some uh, age on it. It's a 1993, so it has a little bit of a sherry note to it. Le Cuvier is a small boutique winery that offers an ample variety to satisfy anyone's craving for white or red. And the inn's wine dinners pair it with the perfect food. All part of the charm of this oasis in the middle of nowhere. Death Valley. While the name may sound foreboding, the setting is truly fascinating. In the big sky country of northern Montana, Glacier National Park is proclaimed the crown of the continent. For over a century, visitors have ventured here to take in the one million acres of scenery. Among the many places to stay at Glacier, we'll uncover a landmark lodge and a mountain getaway. And then you get the mountain goats on top of it, so it doesn't get any better all built by the Great Northern Railroad. And when the park was established, the beauty of the area was not lost on the railroad people. And so they threw all of their resources into an effort to develop visitor facilities here in the park. The railroad opened Glacier Park Lodge in 1913, the first in a series of posh lodges that served up a touch of Europe in the heart of the wilds. Called the Gateway to Glacier, visitors are greeted by an immense lobby. You get into that lodge and you look around, the timbers in there are Douglas fir. Uh, the Indians called it the Tall Timber Lodge. 30 titanic trunks line up, towering 52 feet high and weighing 15 tons. Their tree bark is still remarkably intact resembling the grand cathedrals of Europe in scale and design. Overhead, the ceiling soars to 60 feet, the height of a five-story building. And three skylights let the sun shine in. 
One signature piece, an altar-like table shaped from a half log, is appropriate for this sanctuary to the Montana wilderness. Off the lobby, a solarium acts as a walkway to rustic rooms of various shapes and sizes. Many come with private balconies. The lodge's front porch is a popular spot to hang out. Or you can catch one of Glacier's red touring buses, a trademark fixture of the park since the 1930s. Log lodges are only part of the story of Glacier National Park. There were once nine chalets. Of the four that remain, Sperry Chalet is the most remote. To get there, you can hike or giddy up and head up into the mountains. Glacier was once known as a horse packers park just like the old days, when visitors traveled by horse from one chalet to the next, getting to Sperry means spending over three hours in the saddle. Nestled in the mountains, Sperry Chalet was built in 1913. Stonemasons brought over from Italy hauled the rock up the mountain to create this ruggedly beautiful facade. Inside, guest rooms are private but far from modern. With no electricity or heat, a thick wool blanket will keep you warm. And you'll be glad to have a roof over your head and an outhouse a short stroll away. It's just a little tiny snippet of, of civilization in this, in this great huge wilderness that is Glacier Park. Kevin Warrington's family has run the Sperry Chalet for over 50 years starting with his grandparents. And so they came up in 1954 and they had, you know, by today's standards, hardly any guests and no reservation office. People just walked in and they fed them and gave them a room and there were nights when there was nobody here. Today, all that's changed. Reservations are hard to come by during the summer months when Sperry's open. We are celebrating our 50th anniversary being operated by the same family. <laughs> Meals are a main event where everyone mingles. Behind the scenes, things come together in the chalet's cramped kitchen, part of the major effort it takes to run a backcountry operation. The challenge of running a backcountry chalet is all about supply. We plan our menus and our meals a week or more in advance. Then we have to order exactly the things we need because there's only so many pounds you can fit on a mule. Everything's transported up the mountain trails. Bringing in supplies, groceries, all the timbers were packed in by horses and mules, all the glassware, uh, you name it, it was packed in here, as still as it is today. And it's pack in, pack out. But for the guests, all this effort is well worth it. Sperry, I think, is just so wonderful. You've got this lovely rock chalet that has been here for 90-some years, and you're well taken care of, but yet you have this really remote, almost wild experience here. And then you have the opportunity to meet the other guests and chat with people but doing it in this most gorgeous setting. <laughs> Sperry Chalet offers a Rocky Mountain high like no other, where the atmosphere is relaxed and marmots and mountain goats are neighbors. It's in these places people feel a personal connection to the parks and history. from a long veranda for swinging to a porch for riding or enjoying the moment and so much more. In many ways, these lodges and inns reflect a time in America when the pace was slow and easy.
Yet some things haven't changed. A deserted beach, a course with a desert view, an amazing abyss, or a mountaintop in the clouds are still ultimate getaways. Gracing landscapes both rugged and remote, national park lodges and inns are as much a part of these extraordinary places as the many wonders of nature that unfold around them.